everyone. Welcome to our reflection on the Gospel for the third Sunday of Easter. This is a proclamation of the Holy Gospel according to John. At that time, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And this is how he revealed himself. Together were Simon Peter, Thomas called Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, Zebedee's sons, and two other disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. And they said to him, We also will come with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. When it was already morning, Jesus was standing on the shore, but they did not realize that it was Jesus. He said to them, Children, have you caught anything to eat? And they answered, No. He said to them, Cast your net over the right side of the boat, and you will find something. So they cast the net, but were unable to pull it in because of the large number of fish. The disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. And when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he tucked in his outer garment, for he was lightly clad, and jumped into the sea. The other disciples followed in the boat, for they were not far from shore, only about a hundred yards, dragging the net full of fish. And when they had come ashore, they saw a charcoal fire with some fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish that you just caught. So Simon Peter went out and dragged ashore the net full of 153 large fish. And despite the great number of fish, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, Come, eat breakfast. And none of the disciples dared to ask, Who are you? For they realized it was the Lord. He came over, took bread, and handed it to them, and likewise with the fish. And this was the third time that Jesus was revealed to his disciples after he had been raised from the dead. The Gospel of the Lord. Early in the week, as I began to think about this story, it occurred to me that several questions surface as we think through some of the details in the story, not least of which is this one. If this is the third time that Jesus is revealed to his disciples, why do they not realize that it is he? Why? And why is it that later in the story, after the catch of fish, that they then realize that it is Jesus? What does this say about Jesus and his revelation? What does it say about the disciples? And what does it say is involved in realizing that it is, in fact, the Lord? So I'd like to offer some preliminary answers to those questions. First of all, uh, to realize something is to become fully aware of the fact of something. It is to gain clear understanding. So to become, to realize that Jesus is there, that it is the Lord, is to become fully aware of his presence there. It is to gain a clear understanding of what that identity of Jesus was and meant for them. When we think about uh, what this means for Jesus and his, his revelation, uh, Jesus is uh, a person who has changed as a result of having been raised from the dead. And so there is difference between who he was before he died and afterwards. And there was, in his presence, there was something that was evident and something that was mysterious which meant that for the disciples, every encounter with Jesus would be open to something that is familiar and yet something that is unknown. And what else does it mean for his disciples? It means that to realize that it is the Lord, they are in process. Uh, they're moving from one level of understanding to another level of understanding. And because the presence of the Lord is both evident and unfamiliar, then it makes some sense that uh, 
there are going to be some unknowns in their encounter with Jesus. And so at the beginning of the story, it's plausible that they don't realize it is the Lord. And when we ask, how is it that after the catch of fish, they realize it is the Lord? Uh, I think it has something to do with, and this is only speculation on my part, but I think perhaps they remembered the experience they had with the feeding of the 5,000 with just five loaves and a couple of fish. They had witnessed the apparent multiplication of fish in that story, and the imagery in this story is evocative of the story of that feeding, and so I think the sign value in that prior story had something to do with the disciples now being able to realize it is the Lord. I thought about this early in the week, and it just so happened that unexpectedly on Wednesday evening, I had a conversation that had a kind of resonance with this gospel story, kind of surprising resonance, because it, as I reflected on it, it involved someone realizing what it means to be able to recognize the Lord present in their midst. My conversation partner was a young woman, probably in her late 20s, maybe early 30s at the latest, who was a healthcare professional. And she was someone who takes her faith very seriously and is Catholic and was hoping to find a partner who would also take his faith seriously a faith that they could share with each other and ultimately with any children that they might have. So she found a promising partner uh, about a year and a half ago, and they have been growing together. Uh, but there are some issues that have surfaced because she is Catholic and he is Baptist. And she said one of the things they do is that although they have considerable overlap in their beliefs, there are some things that uh, they have differences over. And she said one of those issues are, is the related uh, question of what does it mean to be saved and what is the timing of baptism? And as she described her potential partner's convictions, uh, she said in his church, uh, there's, they don't believe in infant baptism. Baptism is something that is to be conferred upon an adult who is able to act with full awareness of what he or she is doing. In his church, they believe salvation comes through faith and that salvation, once offered and accepted, is offered once and for all. And she went on to say that his perception of Catholics is that Catholics are people who have what we would call a works righteousness. They believe that they save themselves by doing good works and celebrating religious rituals. She said this creates some tension between us. So Father, how would you respond? So I thought for a moment and shared this. I said for us as Catholics, Everything is rooted in the grace and in the initiative of God. God offers us salvation in Jesus Christ once and for all, but it all comes at God's initiative. God offers and we accept. Uh, we would never say that we save ourselves. In fact, in the 4th or 5th century, there was a controversy over something called Pelagianism, which was a heresy that said, in fact, Christians could save themselves, that uh, grace could come after they saved themselves. So uh, we would say that uh, everything starts from God. Now, when we think about it, our practice of infant baptism means that most people, when they are baptized as Catholics, are baptized as infants, and so probably uh, they do not understand what they are baptized into, the grace and the salvation of God. But on the other hand, as we look back over the course of life, we can say they are baptized into a process of over and over again uh, being exposed to the evident and mysterious presence of Christ in such a way 
that they can realize that it is this Christ. Now, obviously, because um, the child is baptized without understanding, it's possible for there to be an ignoring of the invitation to salvation or a denial of it or a rejection or a besmirching of it through sin. But when that happens, our conviction is that the salvation offered once for all is not withdrawn, but rather it is offered again and again so that the errant person may in fact turn back and uh, embrace again the salvation that was offered once for all. I'm reminded of the a song that all of us know, Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. Tis grace has brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. So when we think about the story of the gospel, and the story of the conversation I had with uh, this woman, there are some things that show themselves to be in common. One is that the uh, primary issue is what does it mean to realize that it is the Lord in our lives? The second is that the encounter with God is always an encounter with through the Christ that is both evident and mysterious. And third, I think it seems to involve some kind of mediation uh, or some kind of role for signs. So having said all that, uh, what might it mean for us to be people who are uh, doing our best to realize that it is the Lord who is present among us? I think one of the things we would want to say is we too are in process. We are in a lifelong process over and over again of trying to understand and recognize and realize the presence of the Lord in so many areas of our lives. Second, for us as well, there, the presence that we bump into is both evident and mysterious so that there's always going to be some unknown element uh, for us. And third, for us too, uh, being able to realize it is the Lord involves signs, more often than not. I'm going to say almost always. And for us, some of those signs we name as sacraments or sacramentals. So, for example, in the sacrament of the Eucharist, we are invited to realize that it is the Lord present in our midst when we gather in church around the altar and take and bless and break and share bread and wine in memory of Jesus. Much as the disciples did in the story of the disciples on the road to Emmaus, we hope that our eyes are open, that we can realize that it is he. However, as in the story of the disciples on the road to Emmaus, once their eyes were open, he vanished from their sight because they didn't need their sight to recognize he was present in their midst. And hopefully, as we gather around the table of the Lord and realize it is the Lord there, our eyes are opened so that when we gather around other tables with family and friends, we would be able to recognize the presence of the Lord around that table as well. Another sacrament that we celebrate is the anointing of the sick. And in this sacrament, we are invited to realize it is the Lord, the compassionate Lord, present with us in our sickness and suffering, and hopefully bringing us healing. And in this marvelous sacrament, the evident and mysterious presence of Christ is joined to the equally marvelous and sometimes terrifying uh, evident and mysterious presence of suffering. And marvelous things can happen when those two things come together. Still another sacrament that we might consider is marriage. And in marriage, there is the invitation for us to recognize in the sign of the love that is between the partners in the marriage, there is an ability to realize it is the Lord present in their marriage. It is the Lord that undergirds and is the foundation of that love. 
It is the Lord which makes their love possible and makes possible the sharing of their love with their children, should they have children, and with the wider community. So when we think about what it means to realize it is the Lord and the role that sacraments might play in helping us to do this throughout the course of life, uh, we can realize that sacraments are not so much things that we get that give grace, but rather they are symbolic actions which help us enter into and to realize this evident and mysterious presence of Christ in our midst. And as we celebrate these sacraments over and over again, what actually happens is we are drawn to accept again and to claim again that salvation that is offered to all of us once for all through Jesus Christ. So by way of wrapping this up, I think today's gospel story invites us to be attentive to opportunities to realize that it is the Lord present among us. Be adventuresome to enter into the mysterious quality of that presence with both trepidation and excitement. And let our repeated being drawn into realizing it is the Lord help us to recognize that presence of the Lord not only in our official church functions, but also through more and more aspects of our lives. Amen. On the basis of these reflections, I thought perhaps it would be good to end with a prayer published on the website of the National Conference of Catholic Bishops. It's called A Prayer for Encountering Christ in Harmony. So let us pray. God of all harmony and source of our faith, loving Father who chose us to be your own and formed us together as one family in Christ, send forth your Spirit among us. May our encounters with Christ, your Son, through the scriptures and the breaking of the bread, remind us of our identity in Christ amid the multitude of cultural heritages present in your church today. May our encounters with the Blessed Virgin Mary and with the communion of saints strengthen us so that we may sustain and pass down the Catholic faith of our ancestors and elders from one generation to the next. May our encounters with one another in our families and parishes nurture more leaders among us that they may answer your call more readily and look to Christ our Savior as an example of humble service. Enliven our hearts this day and always so that going forth into the world, we may become better servants of your word and bearers of your love for all to see. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, who strengthens us in faith and in the power of the Holy Spirit, who binds us together in love and harmony, one God forever and ever. Amen.
through a room.